Thank you, uh, Tina, for the introduction, and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I think listening to the other talks, one of the things that really comes across is the importance of teamwork and, and interacting together, and hopefully that's something that I'll bring out as I talk about treatment. And of course that teamwork is with clinicians, uh, it's with doctors, it's with nurses, it's with the administrators in our department, it's with yourselves, uh, and it's with Lucas UK. And I also want to echo uh, how grateful I am to Lupus UK to, uh, for supporting our research in the past, but also when we were first starting as a Lupus Clinic uh, more than 10 years ago, our initial Lupus sister Sally Sawyer was funded for two terms by, uh, by Lupus UK. So once again, without that contribution, we wouldn't have been able to have those things that have made care uh, so much better and, uh, and so much easier to deliver and particularly things like the helplines are seemingly such a simple thing but something that seems to make such a difference to people. So what I'm going to talk about now is, is treatment and of course treatment is uniquely different for the individuals that we see and that's one of the real challenges with treating people with lupus. Everyone has a slightly different brand of disease that brand is usually expressed within the first few years of the disease and then knowing what the disease is going to be like, you try and tailor treatment. Of course, at the beginning, you can't quite tell so easily, is this going to be mild disease? Is it going to be severe disease? And we have to make judgments depending on, on what we think initially until the, the, the disease expresses itself. And I'm going to talk through a little bit about the types of treatments, mention them, uh, and you, you may know many of the names, talk a little bit about the development of new treatments uh, and new biological therapies, tell you a little bit about that, uh, and a little bit about how we judge how bad someone's going, disease is going to be. But don't forget, if ever I'm talking about some of the bad bits of lupus, most people don't get the bad, scary things. Most people have simpler lupus that is easier to treat, so please don't be frightened if I'm talking about kidney disease or some of the other more serious uh, uh, aspects of lupus that we sometimes see. So what are some of the challenges in, in treatment? What, what would we like to do if we could offer the best possible medical care now? So I'd like to be able to see people early, and that isn't always easy, is it? It's often difficult to get diagnosed, it often takes time to be referred, but the sooner in the disease course I can see someone, the easier it is to get control of symptoms, so that's important. I'd like a reliable diagnosis. That's not always easy, as, as you'll know. Sometimes we still remain uncertain, even when we start treating. We think, on balance, I think this is, but I'm not quite sure, so you have to adapt as you go along. And the prognostic predictors is, how bad is this going to be in the future? Can I guess? Because that's going to influence how aggressively I treat someone. And that's really important, isn't it? At the beginning to say, how bad do I think this person's lupus might be? How much risk do I take with the patient with the type of drugs I use. Do I go for very mild, or do I use more aggressive treatments from the beginning? We need better treatments, and there's more knowledge about that, uh, and, and many of the older treatments that we've used for a long time, like steroids, cause lots of problems if they're used inappropriately, but are still life-saving and very useful in many cases. But we know better how to use them and what doses to use. Uh, and we want to score disease over time. So things uh, that have already been mentioned, the BILAG scoring system, the British Isles Lupus Assessment Group, it's a scoring system to try and look at the, co the complexity of all the bits of lupus. Now one of the other things we want to do is to develop new treatments, and that's actually been a real challenge for lupus. And, and one of the reasons for that might be that the disease is so different between different people that to have a trial that includes patients who have lupus is just too broad. You might need to narrow it down into kidney lupus or brain lupus or skin lupus, and that might make the studies a bit easier. So there have been lots of studies over the last decade or so looking at new biological therapies, and some of those things have worked really well, like belimumab has shown a promise in those studies and we've been allowed to use it, and some of those, uh, those drugs have completely failed. The trials show that they don't work. In the business, we're not sure whether they've all really failed or whether it's just we're not clever enough to have worked out the best way to do the studies yet. So there's a lot of trying to work out how best to do studies around new therapies. And if we're thinking about therapy, these are some of the key questions. So when I'm sitting in the clinic, I might think, so how aggressively do I want to treat? I, every time I give a treatment, I'm exposing someone to risk. How does that compare to the risk of the disease at any particular point? What decision should I make? 
What about the safety of cereals? In fact, we were talking at the break about contributions people make, and one of the biggest contributions I think Graham Hughes has made is actually in encouraging many rheumatologists around the world to use much lower doses of steroids. So he may have described antiphospholipid syndrome, we use it, but actually less steroid, keep the dose as low as you can, is it's very, very important. Which drug to suppress the immune system? Can you treat without steroids? There are some regimes, particularly for very bad kidney lupus, where people have used no treat, uh, steroid tablets at all. One single intravenous injection, and then some of the other treatments, rituximab and something called mycophenolate injection and then tablets. And no oral steroids at all. That's used in West London in the renal unit there by Liz Lightson and seems to work well. So people pushing forwards. Early treatment I've mentioned. Treat to target, that means score the disease, how bad is it, and make a decision based on the score. Don't just guess. Don't just go, mm, how are you? I'm all right. Okay, we'll keep it as it is. Try and measure something more objective like the BiLab score. Knowing when to increase, should it be different at the start to get control and then less treatment over time to con control disease over the long time. Pregnancy has been mentioned already, hasn't it? Many of the drugs we use are very safe in pregnancy uh, and there are guidelines and experience that allow us to know what we can use. So for example, steroids and hydroxychloroquine and azathioprine, those are very safe in pregnancy. And it's much safer to continue the drug than to risk a flare of disease during pregnancy. And some other drugs, like mycophenolate, like methotrexate, we absolutely can't use in pregnancy. So there are things that we alter depending on uh, those, uh, uh, those things. And I've already mentioned the difficulties of getting the trials right. So here are some of the treatments. You'll, you'll know some of these. So corticosteroids, that's steroids, and usually that's prednisolone as tablets. Fantastic life-saving th uh, therapies, but if used too much, cause devastating side effects, which I'll come back to in, in, in a moment. So it's about using the right amount for the right length of time uh, and trying to get that right. Anti-malarials in the form of hydroxychloroquine, very common, and, and generally rheumatologists would like to put all patients on hydroxychloroquine if they tolerate it, because it makes it less likely that the disease will flare or get worse. And it's quite good for joint pain and skin disease. It doesn't control everything, but it's quite good for that. And then immunosuppressive. So that means your immune system gets suppressed a bit. We don't want it suppressed so much that someone gets loads of infections, but we want to suppress it enough that the lupus is controlled. And the classic ones are things like azathioprine, and methotrexate, uh, methotrexate and cyclosporine, and perhaps more modern, but used a lot now over several years, mycophenolate mofetil, which is often used if people have sort of called cell set used when people have kidney disease. And then we've used a lot in the past cyclophosphamide when disease is very bad, when it's life or organ threatening. And cyclophosphamide used to be used in quite high doses. And once again, another thing that St. Thomas is and, and Graham Hughes is responsible for is a, is a regime where we use quite small amounts of cyclophosphamide. It's now called the Eurolupus regime, 500 milligrams every two weeks. And by reducing the doses, we get good control uh, uh, but with far, far less side effects. Now, I'm going to tell you a little bit about a patient in the next couple of slides. There's some scans. It's nothing scary to see. And Becky, whose scans they are, has given me permission to tell you about her story because I think it illustrates some of the difficulties in treating lupus. And I'll come back to her story a little bit later. So this is a, this is a brain scan. Now, Becky I first met when she was about 14 years old. Uh, and this is probably now about 15 years ago, so it's at the start of the time when I was first in Southampton. And she'd had a problem with uh, an autoimmune disease as a small child and had problems with her red blood cells being smashed up by her immune system called hemolytic anemia, and that had been controlled. And when she came into puberty and more oestrogen was uh, kicked in, her lupus started to, to express itself. Skin rashes, blood tests that changed. And she also then developed antiphospholipid sort of Hughes syndrome. She developed some clots within the brain. And these scans show some clots within the veins of her brain. And that made her very, very ill, ITU ill at the time. Now, treatment with blood thinning medicines and with immunosuppressants controlled that disease. And I'll tell you how she's doing now, because she's doing much better. But it's an illustration on this and this other scan. And the white are the blood vessels with contrast that's been injected. And where I'm showing the, where these yellow arrows are going, there should be white and there isn't because there are blood clots within, within, that, uh, within those blood vessels there. 
Now, that's an extreme situation. I said at the beginning, most disease isn't as bad as that. Most people believe this is a very mild disease, which is much easier to treat. Many people have other problems like joint pain and fatigue rather than having these dangerous things. But just occasionally, we need to treat people very aggressively. So this slide is a bit of a crazy slide that's just got lots of writing on it and lots of things. This is meant to show the two round blobs are two immune cells, two white blood cells, talking to each other in the way that they do all the time in your immune system. And in dark type are all the different types of medicines that people have been trying to develop, many of which have failed in their trials, some of which have been successful, some of which are still in development. So you can see that there is an enormous amount of effort from the pharmaceutical industry, from basic science, and from clinical trials, and of course also patients as volunteers taking part in these trials to try and find what works best for the people with the worst disease. And I'll, I'll come back to some of these things, but just wor worth looking at the names. So there's a B cell on the left-hand side, so lots of therapies aim to treat things to do with B cells, that's a white blood cell, so a T cell to the right, and in between they're trying to hold hands and interact and talk to each other as immune cells do. Now when we're choosing the best treatment, we have to weigh lots of things up. How bad's the disease? Is it mild, moderate, severe? Do I use mild, moderate or severe treatment? Which organs involved? Is it the kidneys or is it the skin? Which thing is most likely uh, to be effective? What thing is most likely to be helpful? And how might it work? What's the mechanism of action? Does it fit with the type of disease someone has? And, and as things go on, we get better at targeting those things to the right person. But lupus, of course, as you all know, is a really complicated disease because some people might have hair loss and mouth, mouth ulcers. Some other people might have anemia and a low platelet count. Someone else may have more Hughes syndrome associated with some joint pain and someone else may have kidney disease. So it's so variable that you can't prescribe a particular treatment that is the lupus treatment. It has to be Mrs. Brown's lupus treatment or, or Mr. Jones's lupus treatment. It has to be really tailored to that individual from a, a group of different uh, therapies. And here are all the different areas. It might be skin and lungs and, and joint pain and it might be fatigue and things that we can't see so easily on tests or from examination. Now one of the things that's worthwhile remembering is that the disease starts way before all of us think. This is a study from the United States and what they did is they took military recruits who developed lupus that were identified in the military uh, medical service and then they went back to all the blood samples they'd been giving as part of their standard checks for the decade before and they found that the antibodies for lupus in some of these patients were present 10 years before they started to have symptoms of their disease. So actually the immunological bit of the disease is starting years before we ever get symptoms and years before the diagnosis is made. So if we wanted to treat early, we want to treat really, really early. And even early isn't right at the beginning. So it's worthwhile thinking if we could identify people earlier. One of the other things we think about when we're treating is you always think about what's the demographic of people we treat. And it's already been mentioned, of course, most patients with lupus uh, are women. This slide illustrates that. The top pinker line is the ladies. The blue uh, is the men at the bottom. And this is the number of patients at each age group presenting with lupus from UK data, from a big UK database. And you can see the women really start to get more disease during childbearing years, so it kicks off in the late teens. And then it becomes less again and more gets down to a similar level to the men in later life, postmenopausal. That really shows the effect of oestrogen on the severity uh, and the incidence of the disease. And of course that means we have to select drugs and think about the possibility that women will get pregnant if this is during childbearing years and, and, and that will affect the sort of treatments we use because we want to use drugs that are safe for, for accidental pregnancies or planned pregnancies. And during different stages of life, and here's over on the left hand side, there's the egg that forms us all and there's the little baby and there's us growing through childhood, perhaps having a, a woman having a pregnancy and into old age. There are different risks at different times as people get older. The lupus may generally become milder in terms of organ involvement, like kidney disease, but side effects to drugs become a little bit higher. So you have to weigh that. Whereas during childbearing years, we may be thinking about, I want to pick drugs that are less likely to harm a potential pregnancy. So a number of things that are taken into account when we're choosing. 
Now one of the other things that's been really fascinating to me throughout all my career is how different the disease is in different parts of the world. And I've been really lucky to work in Southampton, to work in London, and to work in Singapore, and to spend some time as a medical student in Chicago as well. And you see people from different backgrounds, from different racial groups, and you see different types of disease and different severity. And that was really brought home to me when I was working in Singapore, because in Southeast Asia, there is far more lupus in a Chinese population or a Malay population than there would be in a Northern European population, in the same way that African-American populations and in the UK, West African and Afro-Caribbean populations have worse disease. And that's important because that means when you're trying to weigh the risk, you might make a decision about an individual and think, on balance, this person is more likely to get severe disease, so I'm just going to watch more carefully and be a bit more um, uh, observant about things, so I'm worried things will change. And this sort of world map, don't worry too much about the numbers, but the, this is meant to be in the number of individuals out of 100,000 in all these different parts of the world. And there are some bits where there's data missing, uh, or the data's uh, much less. But around the world in general, Afro-Caribbean, African, particularly West African populations, you see more lupus. Asian populations, particularly Southeast Asian, you see more lupus. And it's not just more, but it's more severe. Now, of course, these are all generalisations, but they help to decide how you're going to treat. And they help to decide how we're going to weigh up the prognosis, the likelihood of things being bad, which this illustrates. So I've mentioned racial background, I've mentioned age, worse during childbearing years. Certain antibodies in the blood will give us a clue. If infection's there as well, that always makes things more dangerous. And if certain organs are involved, if the kidneys or the brain, not in many people, but in some people, and that just makes it more dangerous. If antiphospholipid syndrome is present as well, and if people have very active disease. So there are things that make me think, oh, I'm a bit worried about this person. I won't get them back in three months, I'll get them back in a month. Or I'm going to do the blood test more often, although I'm going to put them on a slightly stronger drug. There are lots of ways of showing the different types of treatment, and this sort of um, uh, very, very bright, I'm sorry, uh, slide shows moving from left to right the sort of medicines, and this isn't everything. But for milder disease, you might use very small amounts of prednisolone if you have to, trying for the lowest dose and hydroxychloroquine. You might, if it got worse, move into using azathioprine or mycophenolate mofetil. And if things are worse, you might use rituximab, a biological therapy, or belimumab. You might use cyclophosphamide. And of course, this Selena Sleedi Bilag, that's saying do a score, see what the score is and make decisions on the basis of the score. Bear in, in mind other things like osteoporosis that's already been mentioned. Uh, and try and, in other ways, make people healthier. Don't smoke, for example. I was reviewing a paper yesterday uh, which really highlighted a really nice piece of work uh, from Harvard from a lady called Karen Kostenbader. Uh, and she's done a lot of work looking at smoking and making it more likely you get more and worse lupus if, if you smoke, for example. Now, if you talk about steroids, we can't pretend steroids don't cause problems, but they are very, very useful and life-saving drugs to many people. So we can't exclude their use, but we just need to be sure. If we use very high doses, we used to see this sort of problem. This is called avascular necrosis. It means the blood supply to the, to the hip to the ball within the socket in the hip joint can die, that bone can die, and then you need a hip replacement. Thankfully, I see that very, very rarely now. I can think of probably two people in the last 10 years I've seen, but this can happen. People can have higher blood pressure, more diabetes, put on weight, have more osteoporosis. Uh, so we try and limit that dose as low as we possibly can. And, and you can do that. I'll give you an example. So this is some work from one of my colleagues, uh, uh, Mira Badsha, who I worked with in Singapore. Uh, and Humira uh, uh, and the group we put to pulled together a number of patients and looked at different doses of giving steroids. So another way of giving steroids when people are very ill is to give them intravenously, something called methylprednisolone. And traditionally we gave 1,000 milligrams every day for three days. And there's no reason why you have to use that particular dose. And what we did in this particular study is looked at the difference between doing that and giving half the amount, 500, 500, 500 you've got exactly the same benefit with half the number of infections. So it's this reducing, you know, not avoiding completely, but trying to reduce. And this is something that's the only dose that we give in Southampton now. And that's what many of my colleagues around the world would give. Although you still see it being given in higher doses sometimes. 
So what other problems may you get? Flares of the disease, difficult to know when a flare is going to come, but is the flare going to stay? Do you have to treat aggressively? Infections I've mentioned. And it's possible for people with um, inflammation and inflammatory diseases to get a bit more cardiac disease sometimes. So we want to keep an eye on those things, monitor the blood pressure, monitor the cholesterol, those sorts of things. Uh, and osteoporosis, which has been so well described uh, earlier by Dr. Buchanan. And one of the other things, of course, is, is Hughes syndrome. I mean, this illustrates, and once again, I'm sorry, I hope you nobody mind seeing a scan, but this is showing the possibility of having a, a blood clot within the back of the brain associated with antiphospholipid syndrome that occurred uh, after, after a pregnancy. And that's something that if someone has blood thinned, is very, very unlikely to occur. But it's unlikely to occur because we think about it and because we treat it and we try to stop those sorts of devastating events occurring. Now, general health measures, are, I've mentioned already, and here's, here's my smoking advert once again, uh, and that particular study. So good to avoid smoking, eat a good diet. People, there's a bit of evidence that says eating oily fish, omega-3 type diets, having a bit less red meat. These are general health measures that actually are, are promoted for cardiovascular disease as well. But there's some evidence in relation specifically to lupus that that's important. Now one of the other challenges about treating lupus, it can really vary in severity from a very mild rash in the cheeks, which is not dangerous at all to someone, to on the right hand side someone bleeding into the lungs, which is very, very rare, but can be life threatening. And so a real challenge is making the judgement about how bad someone is in tailoring the treatment from very, very mild treatment to very, very aggressive treatment. Now, to understand some of the newer biological therapies, uh, we need to think a little bit about the immune system and what it is. So, first of all, this is this background slide. This is looking at your blood under the microscope. And the clearer, shinier circles are red blood cells. And the other ones that look more purple are white blood cells of different sorts. And you'll see the nucleus, the darker bit inside, there's different shapes in all of them. And the one in the middle to the left with the mainly round-looking central bit, that's a lymphocyte, a B cell or a T cell. The one up to the left might be a neutrophil, and there, and there are various other sorts, and they do different things. And of course, we all have an immune system to fight germs, to protect us from germs. The reason why we're all in this room is because our ancestors were the ones that survived all the terrible infectious diseases of the last 300,000 years. So it means we have to have dead, nasty immune systems. Because we have dead, nasty immune systems, sometimes they get it wrong and they give people lupus. And it's almost the price we pay for having survived through those hundreds of thousands of years, those infectious diseases. But if we understand the immune system, we can try and play with it and block the certain things and not induce too much infection and switch off disease. B cell I mentioned, so on the left hand side, this hedgehog looking thing, if you imagine that's one of these white blood cells, a B cell, can you see it's got all these Y-shaped proteins on it? These are antibodies, and antibodies are released from B cells, and they go around and usually stick to viruses, but lupus can cause harm. And you can see there's the B cell giving a, a shake, and the antibodies going off around the body. But we can use that technology to make biological therapies. And what people do with biological therapies is they do something like take the gene for an antibody and find a particular antibody that will bind to something important in the immune system which we think is important in lupus, like a B cell. Make loads of those antibodies in a big vat. It looks like a brewery if you go to the factory. There's all cells being grown. Purify that and make an antibody that you can inject in somebody which goes along and sticks specifically to a part of the immune system and gets rid of it, like getting rid of a B cell. So here's an antibody. If you imagine I'm an antibody, a Y-shaped protein, my hands are the binding sites. Each antibody has unique hands which will bind to one specific thing. So it's a very specific treatment. If my hands bind to a B cell, I will go and find a B cell, stick to it and kill it. If my hands bind to a growth factor or, or something else important in the immune system, my antibody will go and stick to it and get rid of it. So you can be very targeted and very specific. And in the last few slides, this brings us back to these other antibodies. So if you look on the left hand side, the anti-CD20 antibodies, those bind against B cells. So we know about B cells now, they make antibodies. And rituximab is the one we can use in the clinic. And if we look down in the middle, you may be able to see down here, uh, these are growth factors that help B cells to grow. This is the food that makes them grow, that keeps them healthy. And belimumab is one of the biological therapies we can also use. So those are the two. And there are the many others, that some of which have failed in, in, in development, some of which are still being developed at the moment. 
Now, with any treatment, we have to weigh up the risks and the benefits of what we do. Uh, we have to judge whether it's likely to increase infection or, or, or increase other autoimmune diseases or cause other problems. And that's always something that we're thinking about. But in general, with the biological therapies, they've generally been, been very safe, thankfully, for most people. Uh, and so far, uh, we've been able to use them fairly successfully, although some people can have allergic reactions to them and they can't receive them, we have to change to a different treatment. And this brings us back to the idea of the different steps, choosing the milder treatments, <coughs> prednisolone at low dose and hydroxychloroquine into the disease-modifying drugs or immunosuppressants, and then I've highlighted uh, rituximab and belimumab. And I've done that just to tell you about a couple of trials. So with these particular biological therapies, because these are high cost, because they're newer and we want to be sure they work and that they're safe, we have to put everybody who goes onto these drugs onto a national database. It's called the Bilab Biologics Registry. And a number of centres, including Southampton, are part of the, the steering committee of, of that registry. And the registry is housed in, in Manchester and Ian Bruce uh, is, is the lead person for that uh, within that environment. And this is a very, very useful thing to do because if we record what happens to people in real life, this is even better in some ways than looking at clinical trials, which we need at the beginning because it shows what happens when all people get the drugs, not just the selected people who tend to be more well who get into clinical trials. And this will allow us uh, to, to use it. It's also what the people who pay for the drugs, nice, the... the local payers say we have to do to be able to allow, allow to use the drugs. NHS England will stop giving us the money if we don't do this well as a rheumatological community. So it's really important we recruit. And I've just put in the bottom right hand side, as a result of this you may not be able to see the beat loop per se, just to give you an idea. So there's a, a study that we're taking part in in Southampton. Mike Ehrenstein at UCL is the lead person for this. So anyone getting rituximab for their disease will also in this particular study then go on to get belimumab, another biological therapy because there's some theoretical reasons why having one and then the other might make it an even better treatment, although that might come with some risk. That's why we need to do a trial, so we're recruiting for that study at the moment. There are some real challenges. There are some areas of disease that are very, very difficult. So on the right hand side is fatigue. Tiredness is very, very overwhelming for many people and our treatments are often completely useless at controlling those, as many of you might well know. And you try to use treatments. Sometimes if I give more steroids, people feel a bit better, but I end up just giving them unacceptable steroid side effects. And so what, fatigue has been just very difficult for lupus and for treatment of Sjogren syndrome. Some of the brain disease, the brain fog, those sorts of things, some of the, the things that you also see in Hughes syndrome, in antiphospholipid syndrome as well. And some skin disease is very resistant, some of the scarring disease. So there is a lot that needs to be done in the science to try and work out uh, how best to treat people uh, as we go along. And I thought I'd tell you just as I finish, because this is a, a Lupus UK funded study, about a, a study of using very simple treatment for, for a number of reasons. So this is Ed Vitor, who's uh, a colleague in Leeds, uh, and we share a grant which we apply for to Lupus UK. And that's uh, a grant which allow, is, is trying to allow us to look at what happens to people's joints in lupus. So lots of people have joint pain, but we want to know is that joint pain associated with inflammation inside the joint, in the same way it is with rheumatoid arthritis? And we do we know how to score it well with the scoring systems we use, and do we know how to treat it well? So the study says, here's a person with joint pain but no swelling who has lupus, and we do an ultrasound scan to begin with, and then they have an injection of a small amount of steroid into the backside, an intramuscular injection, which we hope would make that inflammation go away, and we rescan them again uh, at two weeks and then at six weeks. And then we see if it's changed and if the, if the scan is changed. And that helps us to understand how to look inside joints in lupus. It, it makes us understand whether, it, whether things change when you give steroids in this setting. And it allows us to develop better scoring systems and tools to monitor joint pain with people with lupus. So this is a, a simple study uh, that we're doing at the moment, a useful study. And we just recruited our first patient to that study, which is great. Okay. There we go. Now, there is, and I mentioned at the beginning, it's a little bit of frustration, but I think there's lots of hope with treatment. So the frustration for rheumatologists, perhaps for yourselves as well, has been that lots of the trials that people have spent a lot of time, patients have given up their time, uh, and drug companies have spent millions of pounds on running, have not been successful. 
partly that's the drugs not working, partly I think that's the design of the studies, and we're getting smart to that. But I think there is lots of hope. You know better how to use lower doses of steroids, how to use lower doses of cyclophosphamide, how to use the drugs that are available. And mycophenolate and mofetil for renal lupus has been a real, a real benefit because one of the concerns about using cyclophosphamide, particularly for younger women, is you can induce infertility and put someone into an early menopause. Now, it's unlikely with the low doses we use, but that's possible. Whereas if we use mycophenolate mofetil, we can withdraw the treatment once the disease is stable, and three months afterwards it's safe for a woman to conceive, assuming that the disease is controlled. So that's, you know, there are changes to the way we treat because of the drugs that are now available. And I mentioned Becky, you remember that scan of, of Becky's brain, and I mentioned that she had lupus, and that she had some clots in her brain, she was on ITU, very, very ill as a teenager, and, and actually then with uh, small amounts of prednisolone, azathioprine, warfarin, she done, she's done really, really well, and here's a picture of her graduating from university a few years ago. So, success, you know, as, as well as frustration. Okay, and... And I think this echoes back to the, the, the previous talk, doesn't it, well, Carol? It's, it's, it's teamwork, isn't it? There are, it's teamwork with yourselves, with patients, with patient groups, with uh, charities like Lupus UK, with the families of patients, with all the clinicians involved, with the administrators, the people that book the appointments. It's all of the people working together, and you can't do any of it as an individual. And across Wessex, as part of NHS England's rearrangement of services, We've set up a, a, a network, which means all of the lupus-interested doctors across uh, Wessex will meet up and discuss cases that are complicated, things where we want to share it with someone else to make the best decision amongst us. Um, and, and some of that is something that we think is good because it makes for best care, and some of that is also being enforced centrally because some of the ways to unlock some of those high-cost drugs is that we must offer those sorts of services. So there's a bit of carrot and a bit of stick in us offering those services, but I think that's a good thing overall. And finally, uh, this is just to thank lots of people, so thank you very much for having me, um, for inviting me to speak, uh, and uh, thank you to all the uh, people that help me work, the funding bodies, and of course in the middle there at the Lupus UK, so thank you very much for your attention.